Good morning. Welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Kevin McReynolds, and it's my pleasure to welcome you, both guests and visitors and members alike, for our first Sunday in Lent service. Uh, we've turned the corner in the season, and we've entered a new season in the church calendar. And um, just by way of maybe a little moment to educate you, um, you'll note that there are several things that we have removed from our normal worship service um, as we enter into it today. You'll see any any um, indications of praise, so the hymn of praise, any alleluias, those get put away for this season, um, as it is a reverent and penitential season where we reflect on our sins. So several of those elements are taken out of the worship service today. Um, where you'll see them get entered back in is when we get to Easter. And so as we enter these 40 days, um, as we make our journey towards Easter, we reflect on our sins um, and we look eagerly towards what the Lord has in store for us in his Passion Week uh, that culminates with Easter. So I look forward to um, continuing through our church calendar with you. And um, while we do have things to celebrate with our forgiveness of sins, um, we spend a time, a 40-day period, like I said, uh, to reflect on why we need a Savior. So um, another thing that you're going to notice in our service, and it starts with us today, uh, was working with Aaron, um, our director of parish music, to talk about some things that we might do to help um, sort of undergird what our season is about. So what you're going to notice today is that we have just one um, hymn that we will sing during communion. We'll sing it right at the beginning of our communion service. And then from that point forward, um, Carol's our organist today. She's going to play some musical pieces. And that gives you some time, instead of you know looking through your hymnal or watching to be able to sing hymns on the screen, I'd like for you to spend a little bit of time um, in personal reflection, because that's what we're encouraged to do um, when we commune. Um, I've also, if you look in your hymnal, or not your hymnal, in your bulletin, you'll find in the announcement portion, or in the first page there, um, I give you a little bit of a hint there, which any given Sunday, um, you should spend a little bit of time prior to communing doing some self-examination. And uh, one of the places that I uh, turn your attention to there, you'll see, is you can use uh, Christian questions and their answers. That's found on page 329 and 330 of your hymnal. So that's a good thing to read. You can read it after you commune if you're sitting up towards the front um, and you're one of the first tables to commune. But uh, spend that time during the, the hymns and during communion while other people perhaps are communing, doing some self-reflection, um, on your own life, um, on the present, on the past, um, and then remembering what the future has in store for you, that um, in, in the words of the theme of our service today, that the Lord will provide. So hopefully this uh, will be a good uh, season, and we're, we're doing some things a little bit differently in the worship service that will help you um, during this season of Lent. With that, I think we're going to go ahead and dive in um, to our worship service today. So we begin with our opening hymn number 438, We Sing.
Please rise for worship. We'll be following divine service setting two. You'll find that on page 157 in your hymnal if you choose to follow there. We make our beginning this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our service continues with the intro appointed for today, spoken responsively. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge, no evil shall be allowed to befall you. No plague come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. When he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We omit that this is the feast for the season of Lent and continue with the salutation and colic of the day. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. O Lord God, you led your ancient people through the wilderness and brought them to the promised land. Guide the people of your church, that following our Savior we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. The Old Testament reading for this morning is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 22, verses 1 through 18. 
After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here am I. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place of which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But an angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lesson is found in the book of James, chapter 1, verses 12 to 18. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Invite the congregation to please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. We omit the singing of the Alleluia and verse for the season of Lent. Hear now the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, 
and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn number 656. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you all from God our Father and our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for this morning's message is the Old Testament lesson you heard read just a moment ago from Genesis 22. Several years ago, I was still at that time trying to convince my wife that I should quit my job and we should pack things up and move to St. Louis so I could attend seminary. We were arguing, okay, discussing. Fine, there was no discussion. 
she was winning. She was telling me she had no interest in any of it. At that time in our lives, she was staying at home with the kids, our then two children. I was working full time and I was traveling frequently for work. And what we were both aware of was the fact that if I left to go back to school, I would be unable to hold full time employment per seminary requirements. They wanted the student to be fully time committed to their studies. And so what we knew after doing a little bit of research, or more like what she knew was, well, because I wasn't really listening, and she was, and I didn't want to hear it, was that if we went back to school, then I would have to quit my job and I would be a full-time student and we would need a source of income. So she'd have to stop staying at home with the kids and return to the workforce to support our family. Now, for my part, I have to admit, maybe one of the reasons I wasn't listening was I thought it sounded like a pretty sweet deal to have a sugar mama. <laughs> I mean, to have her be the household's primary breadwinner seemed sort of appealing to me. But at the same time, I knew that it was a joint decision between the two of us. And we had made other joint decisions when we were married and when we started our family, not the least of which was that she, we agreed, would be a stay-at-home mom. And now with this idea of me going to seminary, I was introducing chaos into the plan. But I wasn't insensitive to her needs because after our discussion, I think that's what we're calling it now, we both agreed that we would pray about it and see what doors the Lord would open for us. Maybe, maybe he would provide a way. Have you ever had a situation like that in your life? Maybe you had a change, some chaos introduced into your life. You needed to wonder about what it was that you were going to do about something or some big life change. Maybe wondering what the Lord was doing for you or what he was going to do for you when it came to some life change. I know your stories would likely differ from mine, the one that I've shared with you here, but I'm also sure that you have probably been in the same boat that we were in, in some way, shape, or form. Because we've all been there. We've all been left wondering, what are we going to do about this situation or that situation? Or more like, what's God going to do about this situation or that situation? I'll freely admit, in the moment, I wasn't thinking personally well, the Lord will provide. I wasn't even considering that the Lord would provide. I was too fixated on trying to find a way to provide myself. I was too consumed with trying to be the God. Why do we worry that God won't care for us? Why do we concern ourselves with the idea that God won't provide for our needs? Is it rooted in our sinful lack of trust of God? Maybe we don't believe that God will do what he says that he'll do. Maybe we don't take God at his word that he will provide. Or maybe it's that we're more afraid of the way that the Lord will provide. Maybe like his way isn't my way, and therefore it's not the right way. In our epistle lesson today, the brother of James, or brother, brother of Jesus, excuse me, James, writes these words. He says, Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Every not this or that gift, every gift that you have, all the things that you have have been given to you by the Father. Today is the day, side note here, that we also commemorate Martin Luther, which is why the hymn of the day, you know, the sermon hymn that we just sang was A Mighty Fortress, because that's a Luther hymn. I like to paraphrase Luther on this point. Luther says, if you expect anything but the very best from your God, well, then you got the wrong God. In other words, God is always busy giving us the very best. 
Paul puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. What do you have that you didn't receive? And why do you boast as though you didn't receive it? Literally everything that you have. The breath in your lungs, the beat of your heart, the clothes on your back, the roof over your head, the vehicle that you drove to get here today, the family that you share, the money in your bank account, everything you have provided by the Lord. Because the truth is, the Lord will provide. So why do we doubt? Why do we wonder? Why do we worry? Why do we have such a lack of trust in our God, like I discovered about myself. If you look at our Old Testament lesson today in Genesis 22, we come in partway through a fuller story of Abraham and Sarah. If you go back to earlier in their story, you'll learn that they're they're elderly and they're childless. There's no heir in the household. And we don't know this from the text, but it might be safe to assume that they had concluded at that point in their lives, that the Lord wouldn't provide for them an heir. And yet the Lord visits them and shares with them the good news that they will not be left childless. He will provide. And indeed he did. They blessed, the Lord blessed Abraham and Sarah with a son. And if you've ever been in my office, side note here, and you've seen the piece of stained glass that hangs in my office You've seen the picture that depicts the three men of God, the pre-incarnate Trinity, visiting Abraham to share with him the news that his wife Sarah would be with child. It's from Genesis 18, and I love the way this story plays out, so I thought I'd share it with you, verses 10 to 14. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And don't call me Shirley. Come on, guys. I was tempted to do it when Donna read earlier, too, but I didn't. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was listening at the door, at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? (laughs) I just love the story the way it's told. How did Sarah process this? How did she handle the news? She laughed. Did she laugh because she didn't trust in the Lord to provide? Did she not believe the Lord could do what he said he would do? Or was she laughing at her situation because of her age? Two elderly people now to be blessed with a child? And indeed, of course, you guys know the rest of the story. They had a child, and they named him in the Hebrew Yitzhak, which is the word for Isaac, which means laughter. All due to the fact that Sarah laughed about the promise of the Lord's provision. And yet, in spite of her doubt or whatever the cause of her laughing in the face of the Lord, look what happened. The Lord did provide. Which brings us up to today's reading in Genesis 22. This same Yitzhak laughter, well, he wasn't laughing so much when the Lord tested Abraham. Verse 2 from the text, the Lord said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains, which I shall tell you. What? How do you suppose Abraham processes this? I don't think Abraham was laughing either at this point. How could he possibly make sense of what the Lord was asking of him? How could a father just pack up and take his only child, this child that he had lived so long without and now finally been blessed with, and do something out of blind devotion for God and make plans to simply just sacrifice him because the Lord called upon him to do so. It's hard to picture how Abraham could do such a thing. But a part of me, in a strange way, understands a little bit of what Abraham was going through. 
Want to know how I know this? Back to my days of wanting to go to seminary. I have to admit that there was a part of me that didn't want to tell my wife about our plans. Part of me thought, well, as the head of the household, it's just my responsibility to take into account decisions like this, and I'm going to make the decision. Part of me knew that what my wife didn't know couldn't hurt her. And maybe that's what happened with Abraham and Sarah. We don't know, did Abraham tell Sarah what he was about to do? And I wonder if it's not unlike Abraham in some way. I wonder sometimes what went through his mind in that moment. If he told her, if he just said, I'm going to follow this blindly and do what the Lord instructs me to do, would he share with his wife what he was about to do? You know, she'd be, he would be crazy to think even suggesting such a thing was a possibility. I mean, she finally gets to be a stay-at-home mom with this kid, Yitzhak. And now Abraham's going to go ruin it all? I could hear the conversation in my own context. You're going to take him and make a sacrifice to the Lord? I know it sounds crazy, honey, but hear me out. Now, the story doesn't indicate that Abraham even flinched or had a conversation with his wife, Sarah. The story only tells us that he went to do what the Lord instructed him which is directly in character with this man, Abraham. Because if you go back to Genesis 15, verse 6, we read that Abraham trusted the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. In a Lutheran-speak way of saying things, that's that Abraham's faith made it possible for him to follow the Lord's command willingly, to trust that the Lord would indeed provide. It shows that Abraham had a track record over time of believing that the Lord could do the impossible, and that made him willing to do the unthinkable, which was to give up his son. Why? Because he'd seen it before. He wouldn't even have a son. This good gift from above that the Lord had promised him had the Lord not provided in the first place. He had no reason to believe the Lord couldn't provide again, even if that meant the Lord would take this son, laughter, from him to give him another son. Abraham acted on faith that the Lord would provide. Now, certainly I've not been asked or called upon by God to sacrifice any of my kids, and if they were here right now, I would tell them, you're welcome, Cole, Anna, and Tate. But fair to say, I have been tested at times by the Lord. And I know that you have, as we acknowledged earlier. I've been tested more times than I can remember. And in each of those instances, every one of them, I found it difficult to trust in the Lord. I found times when I felt like he was asking more of me than I was able to give. But in the story that I'm sharing with you of our debate about going to seminary, I can tell you that by the time we were having our argument, I mean discussion, about what our future held, I had an inner peace. I felt pretty good about the decision. I didn't know how the Lord would make it happen. I didn't know what the Lord would do. But at that point in my life, after a lifetime of witnessing what the Lord had provided for me, I just knew that if this is what the Lord's will for us was, that he would provide a way for us to go and leave for seminary. Well, if this is going to happen, Lord, then you're going to have to provide. You're going to have to make it possible for us. And listen, like Paul Harvey says, you guys already know the rest of the story. Here I am standing in front of you. The Lord did provide. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a pastor standing in your midst telling you this silly story from my past. The Lord absolutely provided in the moment. Not only did he provide the means for us to go do what we did, he provided the faith necessary for us to step out into the unknown.
and do what we thought was impossible. You're probably familiar with the old adage, God will never give you more than you can handle, right? Well, that's an outright lie. It's a misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 10, 13, where the text says, no temptation has overtaken you that's not common to man. God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability, but with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Note that it never said you won't be taken over by temptation. It absolutely says you will be taken, overtaken by temptations. It openly acknowledges it. Likewise, James speaks the same way in today's epistle. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test. See, we're going to be tested. We're going to be tempted not to trust God. We're going to suffer those times and trials. But James, he says, when you are tested and you have stood the test, you will receive the crown of life which God has promised. James offers the good news that the crown of life awaits those who believe and trust. So we look to the example of Abraham. He and his wife Sarah perhaps already resigned to the fact that they would never have an heir of their own, and yet the Lord provided one for them. And through this provision, the Lord elicited from them yet again another response of trusting faith. Or... If you choose to do so, use the example I've given you of my own life. When resigned to the idea that I probably wouldn't be able to go to seminary, the Lord provided, proving to us that he had a plan all along. See, I had some savings laid up from very early on. My family owned a business. They put us to work. I made a couple of bucks every now and then, and my mom and dad showed us how to put money off in a 401k. And through this savings and through talking with some financial advisors, we found a way that we could roll that money into an IRA and use that money to live on for the four years that I attended seminary. It was one way that we found that the Lord will provide. I knew that it wasn't my money. I knew the Lord had provided the savings in the first place. He gave it to us. So who am I to say that it's mine and I can't? Give it back to the Lord. Who am I to say that he can't provide for me in some other way? Who am I to argue with the Lord if this is indeed what he is asking of me? Why would I not follow in faith? Look, I'm not bragging. I'm no Abraham. I was never called upon to sacrifice a child of mine. Maybe Tate is our Yitzhak. I have to laugh about that because he's our seminary surprise the Lord gave to us. Shh, secret's out. We were only able to do what we did because we had seen example upon example, and not just examples of our own life. We'd seen examples of these pillars of the faith, like Abraham and Sarah in Scripture. But even more so, we've seen the example of our God, because our God provided in a way that supersedes our ability to understand. God sent his only son. In the act of sending Jesus, God proved beyond a shadow of a doubt to me, to my wife, to all of us, that he will indeed provide. He provided a perfect substitute for our sins. For all the times that I've been tempted and failed, I'm not standing here bragging about any of those times to you, but those times, they exist in my life. They probably exist in Abraham's life too, but we just don't get to read about them because they weren't recorded for us. For all the times that I've been, should have been faithful but faltered, for every sinful moment of my sin-stained life, God sent his son Jesus and provided to do what I would be unable to do, to do what I was unfaithful to do, the Lord would provide. 
Jesus believed it. When tempted in the wilderness, we read from Psalm 91 today in our intro. That's the psalm that Satan quoted against Jesus. When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness without food, he rebuffed Satan's attacks by reminding Satan that man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus himself being the word incarnate. Flash forward in Jesus' life to his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane that God would remove the cup of suffering from him that he was about to endure. Jesus may have seemed tempted, but he finished his prayer in Luke twenty two forty two by saying this, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. Proving that Jesus, the Son of God, would trust fully that the Lord would provide. And indeed, he did. With his death on the cross, Jesus was the one that the Lord provided. But Jesus, as was pointed out to me at my time during seminary, also trusted that if he was to go to the cross and die there, God could also raise him from the dead. And indeed, he did. The Lord provided his own son, but provided also for his own son, giving him life and victory over the grave. And this gift, Jesus teaches, he gives to each and every one of you. You too will live if you believe in faith, even if you die. Whatever life throws at you, whatever the worst that comes at you in life, what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, I suppose you could die. But our God has provided the sacrifice, his son, Jesus Christ, to die in your place so that all who believe on his name, though they die, yet shall they live. So what's the worst thing that could happen? Not much. Believe that the Lord will provide. I realize that Jesus had yet, had yet to be made incarnate at the time of the story of our reading in Genesis 22. I get it that Abraham likely had not a clue of God's plan of salvation at that stage of the game. It was still very early in the story of salvation when we arrive at the story of Abraham and Sarah. But I do know this, that Abraham knew the promise of God that was right there in our text today that he had an heir, just as God had provided for him. And that through an heir of his, there would be more descendants than could be numbered the stars or sands of the beach. That kings and princes would descend from this heir of Abraham. And I know that Abraham believed it. Little did he know, perhaps, however, that the Lord himself Jesus would be among those descendants, the very Son of God. Abraham wasn't concerned with that, and nor did he need to be. He just took the word of the Lord at face value and believed that the Lord will provide. There at that day, caught in a thicket by its horns, the Lord provided a ram so that Abraham could make a sacrifice in place of Yitzhak. It was a foreshadowing of the lamb that the Lord would provide for you and for me and fulfill the promise that he made to Abraham. In Christ, God has provided the sacrificial lamb. He's put his only son on the altar of the cross for your sins and in your place, and in so doing, he has rescued you from sin, death, the devil, and any temptation that has ever befallen you. And believe this, he will be with you through any trial, temptation, difficulty, or decision. And you can trust him. The Lord will provide. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, may it guard your hearts and your minds and keep you in faith that the Lord will provide until life everlasting. Amen.
Please stand as we join together and confess our common faith in the triune God using the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For faith to follow our Lord Jesus and resist temptation, that we would come through this fallen world to dwell with him forever, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church of God, guarded by the Lord who bore the wood of the cross, that her ministers and people would be certain that the gates of hell cannot prevail against us, and for boldness of faith, that we may trample every power of the enemy underfoot, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. For all catechumens and their teachers, all children and parents and every Christian home, that God would preserve them from the assaults of the evil one, And just as Christ overcame Satan in the desert by the word of God, give to them the victory through him and his word. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. To the Father of lights, from whom every good and perfect gift comes, that he would keep us from all sinful desires and misuse of his gifts, for his help to use them in service to our neighbor, and that he would bless Joseph and all leaders that govern us wisely for the good of this and future generations, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for our brothers and sisters who suffer in our midst, especially those in our prayer list on our bulletin and those we name before you in our hearts and minds. That God most high, our refuge in every trouble would command his angels concerning them and keep them from every evil of body, mind, or soul. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. We pray for all who commune at the altar this day that in the blessed sacrament they would acknowledge the time fulfilled and the kingdom at hand in Christ Jesus, receiving his body and blood with repentance and faith. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, see how the adversary continually afflicts us and walks about as a roaring lion seeking to devour us. We implore you for the sake of suffering and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, to help us by the grace of the Holy Spirit, to strengthen our hearts by your word, that Our enemy would not prevail over us, but instead we would be able to abide evermore in your grace and be preserved to life everlasting. We pray this through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated now as we collect our gifts and offerings to the Lord. Also at this time, I'd like to encourage you to fill out the fellowship cards located in the pew in front of you. Uh, On the proper side, there's a side for guests and visitors and a side for members. Once you've filled out the card, please place it into the offering basket as it comes down your aisle so that we can gather them up and properly acknowledge your presence with us in worship today. Thank you.
Please stand as our service continues with the singing of the offertory. Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes, the name of the Lord in the highest. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. 
Lamb of God, you take away. word of dismissal for those unable to approach the altar this morning. Now may this true body and blood of our risen Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the one true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace and joy your sins are forgiven. Amen. I invite the congregation to please rise for the post-communion prayer. We omit the singing of the thank the Lord for the season of Lent. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn number 547.
Well, once again, a warm welcome uh, to all of you, uh, guests and visitors and members alike who've joined us for this morning's service. Pray that it's been a blessing for you today and that, um, that through the heard word and through the received sacrament, faith would be engendered in you, a faith that's able to trust and believe that the Lord will indeed provide for you. Uh, a couple of quick things for you with the upcoming week. Um, just a reminder that um, because we're in the season of Lent and we had Ash Wednesday this past Wednesday, we've begun our midweek Lenten preparation series. Uh, we're focusing on a, a book, um, a treatise that Luther put together with Philip Melanchthon uh, on the freedom of a Christian. And uh, it's a series that I put together several years back and uh, I'm kind of retooling for our purposes here. So we'd love to have you join us. Our services are at 10 a.m. Uh, in the morning or 6 p.m. in the evening. And uh, we'd love to have you be here and be a part of that with us. Um, everything else, I'm just going to, the schedule for that, by the way, is in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along with that. Um, everything else, I'm going to commend to your reading with the bulletin. Hang on to them if you need to so that you have that information with you. Um, and I pray you have a blessed day and week in the name of the Lord. Amen. <laughs>